Good evening, everyone. Thank you all for being here. I know it's not easy to get here on a Wednesday night during Lent, but uh, especially during rush hour times, but um, we're very, very overjoyed to have all of you with us tonight. I'm also overjoyed to uh, introduce and present our speaker for the evening, uh, Deacon, Reverend Deacon, Reverend Doctor, excuse me, uh, Perry Hamelis. Uh, Deacon Perry was born and raised in this area, Chicago area, and he is the Cecilia Schneller Mueller Professor of Religion at North Central College in Naperville, uh, where he teaches courses in religious and philosophical ethics. Deacon Perry earned a, a Bachelor's of Arts in Philosophy from Boston College, an MDiv from Holy Cross Greek Orthodox School of Theology, and a PhD in Ethics from the University of Chicago. During the 2015-16 academic year, he was awarded a Fulbright Senior Research Fellowship and was appointed as a visiting professor of theology at Yonsei. Is that how you pronounce that? Yonsei. Yonsei. Go almost. University in Seoul, South Korea. It was during this time that he was ordained a deacon of the Ecumenical Patriarchate by His Eminence Metropolitan Ambrosius of Korea. Deacon Perry has lectured across the United States, Greece, Switzerland, Germany, Australia, and Korea on topics pertaining to Eastern Orthodoxy, death, bioethics, and social ethics, and he has over 30 academic publications. His most recent work is the book Orthodox Christian Perspectives on War, published by the University of Notre Dame Press, which he co-edited with Dr. Valerie Karras. We're very blessed to have such a, a person with such an extensive uh, uh, pedigree and uh, resume attached to his name to come and speak to us uh, tonight here at Panagias. And uh, with, without further ado, I'll ask uh, Deacon Perry to come forward. Thank you all for your willingness to be here. As Father Dimitri said, it's a great joy and honor for me, and I want to thank uh, Father Timothy and Father Demetrius, um, all of you, my sisters and brothers in Christ. Christ is in our midst. It's a great joy and honor to be with you tonight at this historic community of Chemesis, Assumption of our Assumption Greek Orthodox Church of Chicago, and to be praying together and to have just celebrated the pre-sanctified liturgy together, a very moving and beautiful liturgy. And I would like to especially thank uh, Dr. Evelyn Magus, uh, the entire parish council, and all who prepared for this evening's event. It's no accident that right as we begin Great and Holy Lent, the church places before us the message of forgiveness, Cheese Fair Sunday. In addition to being the last day for consuming animal products, Cheese Fair Sunday is also both Forgiveness Sunday and a day on which we commemorate the expulsion, the kicking out of Adam and Eve from paradise. So in other words, as we begin the annual journey to Pascha, as we began our Lenten journey, we are reminded on the one hand of the very first sin and on the other hand, of the possibility of forgiveness, of the rebellious separation of humanity from God, and of the reunion, restoration, and healing that is made possible by forgiveness. And from this dual focus, we see right away three key points. First, the role of freedom. Second, the grounding of forgiveness in the reality of sin. And third, the spatial dimension of forgiveness. So let me just say a word about each of these before we move a little bit more into some of the how, the dynamics or the process of forgiveness. First, the role of freedom. Both the expulsion of Adam and Eve from paradise 
and the phenomenon of freedom underscore the reality and the significance, uh, I'm sorry, and, and the phenomenon of forgiveness underscore the reality and the significance of freedom. Part of what sets us apart from the rest of creation as human beings is the fact that we are created in the divine image and we have been granted freedom. We were created with free will, or what the church fathers call to aftexusion, the capacity for self-determination. Freedom, of course, is risky. It is a godlike quality. At its heights, freedom makes love possible. It is what philosophers would call a necessary condition for the possibility of love. We've all experienced this, I imagine. We've all tried to force love. We've all tried to make someone love us at some point in our lives, and it just simply doesn't work. Freedom is required. Maybe it was someone that you had a crush on back in the fifth grade, or maybe it was a relative who was simply unwilling to reciprocate our offer of love. Love presupposes freedom. Love cannot be forced no matter how much I want and no matter how hard I try, I cannot make someone love me, right? So love and freedom go together. This is so simple and basic, but it's also so beautiful because it tells us actually a great deal about God. God, of course, didn't have to create human, humanity or human beings with free will. However, if God's desire was and is to be in a loving relationship with us and for us to be in a loving relationship with him and with each other, then the gift of freedom was absolutely necessary. God took a huge risk in giving us freedom, but this is the way of love. It's inescapably risky, right? So in order to have love, we have to have freedom. The heights of freedom's exercise is love, or the height. The downside of freedom, as we know, is that it can be used to reject, to rebel, to hate, and even to kill. The expulsion of Adam and Eve was precisely this. It was the result of Adam and Eve's free act of rebellion against God. A transgression of the one commandment that he had given them. A decision to follow the serpent's advice and not the advice of God. It was a rejection of and separation from their creator. The one who literally brought them into being out of nothing. And it's interesting, or it's important to note that God does not stop human beings from such abuses of freedom. He doesn't stop us from abusing our freedom. He respects our freedom. He must do so if he's also going to allow for the possibility of love. As soon as God stops us from acting out even against him or against our neighbor, then he has eclipsed the possibility for love. So freedom makes both love and sin possible. It makes both life and death possible. There's a beautiful passage from Father Sophroni Sakharov. He says, relations between God and humanity are based on the principles of freedom. Our final self-determination with reference to God depends on our own discretion. When in our liberty we opt for sin, then we sever the ties of love and withdraw from God. The possibility of negative self-determination in connection with our Heavenly Father, constitutes the tragic aspect of liberty. But this risky free will of ours is nevertheless an essential condition 
for the created human person in his or her progress toward the assumption of divine life. That's a very meaty quote, but basically what Father Sophroni is saying here is that freedom is necessary if love is going to be necessary, if love is going to be possible. But freedom, of course, also can be exercised tragically towards sin and death. A final point about freedom, and one that we'll return to, is that like love and sin, forgiveness also hinges on freedom. Both to forgive another and to accept forgiveness are acts of free will. To offer and to receive forgiveness are choices. They are within our capacity as human beings. They are made possible by the fact that we were made in the divine image and gifted with self-determination, with the freedom to make decisions. Forgiveness, then, cannot be forced, just as love and sin cannot be forced. Okay, the next point, the grounding of forgiveness in the reality of sin. Let's turn to a second point that the church communicates on Forgiveness Sunday. Namely, that the grounding of forgiveness is the reality of sin. So what do I mean by that? I mean that if there's no sin, there's no need for forgiveness. There can be love without sin, but there cannot be forgiveness. Forgiveness only occurs after someone has acted against God or neighbor or creation. It makes sense, therefore, that on the same day that we commemorate the ancestral sin, the fall of Adam and Eve, we also commemorate Forgiveness Sunday, or vice versa. On the day we commemorate forgiveness, we also commemorate the first sin, the sin of Adam and Eve. We embark on the Lenten quest conscious of both the expulsion of humanity from paradise and with the awareness of the potential for forgiveness, both the abuse of freedom and the hope of forgiveness, the hope of freedom. So the fact that there can be no forgiveness if there is not also sin carries actually a practical consequence. It means that when, that when forgiveness is being offered or accepted, that we acknowledge implicitly that a sin has occurred. In other words, to receive or forgive, in order to offer or receive forgiveness does not imply that, what was, that uh, what was thought or said or done was not wrong. When we forgive someone or when we ask for forgiveness, it doesn't mean that what happened wasn't a sin. It means the exact opposite. It means that something was wrong in what was said or thought or done. Oftentimes, we hear children speak by saying, I'm sorry to another child and to, you know, to a child, a fellow child, and then the, the other child says, it's okay. Right? We've all heard that. Like, you know, I'm sorry I broke your doll. It's okay. Or, I'm sorry I punched you in the head. It's okay. And of course, this exchange can be misleading because what happened, if it merits an apology, was really not okay. But we do this as adults as well, not just as children, right? We say, it's okay, or it doesn't matter. But it would be better. It would be better especially if the offense is not just something trivial, it would be better to say, I forgive you, or I accept your apology, or thank you for apologizing, I forgive you. Because when we say, I accept your apology, or I forgive you, we underline both that there was a transgression, there was a sin, there was something that needed to be acknowledged, and we acknowledge that freedom is being exercised both by the person who's 
apologizing, seeking forgiveness, and we are exercising our freedom in granting forgiveness. Those of you with young children, I would encourage you to explain this to your kids, that it's better to say, I accept your apology, or I forgive you, or thank you for apologizing, I forgive you, to explain why that's important, and to not just say, it's okay, because really, it's not. Okay, let's move to the next point, the spatial dimension of forgiveness. So what do we mean here? Um, putting together the expulsion, the kicking out of Adam and Eve from paradise and Forgiveness Sunday also has a spatial dimension to it. When we think about the narrative from the, from the book of Genesis, the narrative of Adam and Eve's sin in Genesis chapter 3, there is a clear message that sin generates separation or distance between God and humanity, and also between human beings. Recall first the words from Genesis chapter 3, verses 7 to 10. Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made loincloths for themselves. They heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden at the time of the evening breeze, and the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? He said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. End quote. So think about this. Adam and Eve hid themselves, and their act of hiding is an effort to get away from God, to create distance. The man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord among the trees of the garden. Sin does this, both on a spiritual level, it distances us, and oftentimes on a physical level. Again, those of you that have children or have children in your lives around you, you know that sometimes a child who has done something wrong will do what? Go and hide, right? Or go to the opposite corner of the house, right? Go downstairs and sit in the corner or go way up in their room and close the door and sit in the corner to get away from facing the closest thing to God for them, which is their parent. But we also experience this as adults and in our relationships with God, right? If we sin in a serious way, in a deep way, we may stop going to church. We may put distance between ourselves and God. We may try to hide in the trees. We may stop praying. We may not even want to see an icon because we feel that real gap that sin creates. The space between seems immense. And of course, this doesn't simply fix itself. It's also worth mentioning that while Adam and Eve try to hide from God, they also notice the space between the two of them, between themselves. They become aware of their nakedness and they try to cover themselves. This is such a powerful image, I think, of, of broken communion, of distance. Adam and Eve put something between themselves, fig leaves, because they are no longer one as they were before their sin. Right? Now there's a gap that makes them aware of their separateness and their nakedness. Not only did a distance emerge between them and God, it emerged between husband and wife. I think we do something similar as friends or couples. When we hurt someone, it creates a distance, a separation, a ceasing of communication. There is no quickly returned call, no text response, 
no conversation or closeness. There's, there is instead alienation, a gap, a space between that wasn't previously there and that will not, that will not simply go away on its own. Some of you know um, Dr. Philip Mamalakis, professor at our school, our theological school of Holy Cross in Brookline. And he describes how in our relationships with others, we are continuously making choices, exercising our freedom, right? Making choices between three options, turning toward, turning away, or turning against. So what does that mean? Well, if I leave my dirty clothes on the floor, again, my wife, uh, the Akonisa Paniyota, has a choice when she becomes aware of my transgression. Will she turn and move toward, turn away, or turn against me? Keep in mind that it was my choice to leave them there that created the initial gap between us by being inconsiderate of her, a distance is generated. Now, she could turn toward me and say, my love, your clothes are on the floor. Could you put them away when you have a minute? Thanks. And in fact, this is what she most often does. That would be turning toward. Alternatively, she could turn away from me, either with the silent treatment or leaving without a hug goodbye or putting as much space between us in the bed as possible. She might not say anything about the clothes, but the distance is there and it won't magically disappear. It's also possible that she could turn against me, especially if this is the hundredth time that it has happened. Of course, none of these op options have actually happened that I'm about to suggest. But she could groan and storm out of the house, or she could yell at me, you always do this, I'm not your maid, something like that, right? She could pick up those socks and serve them to me on a plate for dinner. That never happened. But it would be a good idea in some circumstances. But again, my inconsiderate act and my wife's turning and moving toward, away, or against me all highlight the spatial dimension of sin. The ultimate spatial image of sin, I think, comes a bit later in the book of Genesis, chapter 3, 22 to 24, where it reads, Then the Lord God said, See, the man has become like one of us, and knowing good and evil. And now he might reach out his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore the Lord God sent him forth from the garden of Eden to till the ground from which he was taken. He drove out the man. And at the east end of the garden of Eden, he placed the cherubim and a sword flaming and turning to guard the way to the tree of life. So where do we see the spatial imagery there? The Lord sent him forth from the garden. He drove out the man, right? Here we see the reality of distance being created. Adam and Eve are out, expelled, removed from paradise. Why? Because they sought to become gods without God, to become gods apart from God, rather than in and through loving communion with God. They sought self-theosis rather than true theosis. So with the spatial dimension of sin in mind, let's turn our attention to the spatial character of forgiveness. There are, as you probably know, multiple words for forgive or forgiveness in Greek. In the Lord's Prayer, the verb afimi is used, kaafes imin, and oskemis afiemen, 
which literally means to release or to remit. But the more common term that we use in our tradition for forgive and forgiveness is what? In Greek, sihoro or sihorasi, right? And etymologically, this is a spatial term, sin, together, and choros, space. So as uh, Father Zacharias of Essex writes, the Greek synchoro, to forgive, means literally to place in the same space in the heart. Forgiveness is sharing space. It is the restoration of communion. It is overcoming distance or bridging the gap that exists between persons. Forgiveness removes that, the separation that sin has generated between humanity and God and between human beings. So Lent is the season for increasing our shared space through forgiveness. Forgiveness is turning to one another, speaking our sin, offering forgiveness, and stepping in to embrace one another in freedom and love, sharing space. Sihorisi. And all of this gets us finally to a place where we can better grasp the meaning of the actual title for this talk, which is, Forgive Us As We Forgive. These words, most well known, of course, from the Lord's Prayer, are also placed before us during the gospel reading on the Sunday of Forgiveness. And the passage is from Matthew chapter 6, verses 14 and 15. For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. So there are two points that are worth noting here. First, these words immediately follow the Lord's Prayer. They come right after the Lord's Prayer in the Gospel of Matthew. It's as if they are a summary of an already concise message. Forgiveness is the key. St. Gregory of Nyssa actually calls those phrases, forgive us our debts or forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those, calls those phrases the, the pinnacle of the Lord's Prayer. And second, and what's perhaps most striking about them, these words, is that they clearly communicate a condition. They are an if-then statement. Right? I don't know if any of you are computer programmers here. If-then statements are a big part of computer programming and logic, of course. Actually, there are two if-then statements. If you forgive others, then God will forgive you. But if you do not, then neither will God. That's two if-then statements. And we can add a third, the one that comes in the Lord's Prayer, right? Which most accurately reads, forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors, right? <laughs> So we have three conditional statements, all within just a few verses there, all about forgiveness. So the message here is undeniable. God forgives if we forgive. This means that for us, hope for God's forgiveness hinges on our own capacity to forgive others. There is no other way. Salvation is impossible without God but it is also impossible without our willingness to forgive. Salvation is impossible without God. We do not save ourselves by offering forgiveness. It's impossible without God, but it is also impossible unless we are willing to forgive others. Consider these powerful words from St. John of Kronstadt. He writes, 
Your salvation is in your hands, within your power. If you will forgive others their offenses and sins, their nuisance and constant requests, then your sin will be forgiven. And you, with your own nuisance and constant requests to God, will never go away from him empty-handed and will receive from him great and abundant mercies. The Lord requires so little of us that we forgive others' offenses, which are like drops in the ocean when compared to our sins against God. What strikes me here is, first of all, the conditional nature again of God's forgiveness, but second, the immense imbalance between the sins others commit against us, on the one hand, and the sins we commit against God. Forgiveness is conditional, but it's by no means equal. My mother, Pauline Hamalas, passed away about three years ago. And she taught all of us a very powerful lesson as she was on her deathbed in hospice care in our home. Every time the phone rang with, from a family member or a friend or a distant neighbor or someone that was calling to see about her had heard about her being sick, every time the phone rang, she picked up the phone and she said, I want to ask you first for forgiveness if I've done anything in my life to hurt you. And then she continued with her conversation, however much strength she had. But this was a witness to me, first of all, and all of us. What does it mean to live and die as an Orthodox Christian? Think about that. She knew that if she could forgive and be forgiven by others, God would forgive her, no matter how severe our sins may be, no matter how many they may be. Almost done. You okay for a few more minutes? Okay. So we've discussed the spatial dimension, but there's also a temporal dimension. Um, time does not heal all things, and to forgive does not mean to forget. And here I think we have to make a distinction between psychological and ontological. Those are kind of fancy words I know, psychological you know, but ontological. On the psychological level, time often does help us to heal. Right? We say time heals all wounds and things like this. Time does help psychologically. The acute feelings of hurt subside over time, oftentimes, not always. But this does not mean that we are healed from sin's effects on the deeper ontological level, on the level of our existence, our being. Time does not automatically heal us ontologically. This can only happen, ontological healing can only happen through genuine forgiveness. Some of you may have heard of Father Vasilios Thermos. He's a medical doctor and psycho psychotherapist and a priest in Greece. He has a beautiful essay that's called, I Forgive, Therefore I Am. We all know the famous claim of Descartes, I think, therefore I am. Others have said, I love, therefore I am. Father Thermos says, I forgive, therefore I am. Forgiveness is life. It brings us to life after we have been separated and in a state of death. It is resurrection. Forgiveness is resurrection. I also mentioned to forgive does not mean to forget. Forgiveness heals us, but it does not mean that we forget what happened. 
Christ rose with his wounds. A reminder of what his creation did to him, what we did to him. And Elder Zacharias recommends that in order for us to remain in a state of contrition, in a state of repentance, we have to remember our sins. We have to remember our sins, even if they have been forgiven. This helps to keep us in a state of vigilance, a state of contrition, a state of repentance. So to forgive is not to forget, but to have a different relationship, a new relationship with the person we hurt or who hurt us. It's a transfigured relationship, one in which God's grace emerges from our scars. This is forgiveness. It's not forgetting, but a new relationship. How do we know if our forgiveness is genuine? St. John of the Ladder says, putrefaction will go away not when you pray for the person who offended you, not when you give him presents, not when you invite him to share a meal with you, but only when, on hearing of some catastrophe that has afflicted him in body or soul, you suffer and you lament for him as if for yourself. That's the deepest kind of forgiveness. When the person that has hurt you when your relationship with that person has been so transfigured that when something bad happens to them, you suffer. That's how you know you've reached genuine forgiveness. You genuinely are now in the same space as the other. Okay, I end now. Father Thomas Hopko of Blessed Memory writes that the proclamation, God forgives us, is the essence of the gospel. God forgives us is the essence of the gospel. God is the father to each of, to each of us who is the prodigal son or daughter. Right? God respects our freedom. God lets us leave, take our inheritance and leave. But as soon as God sees us turn back, as soon as God sees us on the horizon turning back and heading home, God runs with open arms to embrace us and welcome us back. God runs to close the distance when he sees us approaching with a desire for forgiveness. God shares space with us as quickly as possible, as soon as he sees us coming to him in a spirit of forgiveness and seeking forgiveness. The gospel's message, however, is also clear that God's condition for forgiveness and communion with him is that we forgive others. Forgive us as we forgive. And this request is actually a perfect expression of God's love. Why wouldn't God just say, all you have to do is come to me for forgiveness? Why would God say, I will forgive you if you forgive others? What's the point there? God would be incarnated and die and rise again for even one sinner to be saved. But God desires that all be saved and that communion be restored among and between all of us even between enemies. This is the purpose for which he created us with freedom as persons in the divine image. This is the purpose for which he became human, lived, was crucified, forgave. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Died and resurrected. I forgive, therefore I am. May the Spirit be with us as we continue toward the Lord's resurrection and in all of our life.
forgive me. Uh, at this time, um, if, there are, if there are any questions for Deacon Perry, we'd like to open it up. We'll take maybe one or two questions before we head to for the refreshments. Are there any questions? I have one. Um, when you said forgive our debts, is transgressions one and the same? Yeah, it's a very good question. Um, you know, there's an ongoing debate about this. And the, the first thing to say is that there are two versions of the Lord's Prayer in the New Testament. Uh, there's one in the Gospel of Matthew and there's one in the Gospel of Luke. And the version that we say, that we all know, is from the Gospel of Matthew. Um, but there is also um, the Lord's Prayer in the Gospel of Luke, and um, just so that I don't misspeak it, uh, it, it's the, it starts in the, exactly the same manner, but then it says, um, Forgive us our sins. Right? Right? So, so what we see here is that the message is debts, right? Um, of course, the, the, when, we, when we talk about um, uh, ophiletes or ophil, uh, ophilimata, we're talking about debts in the way that someone owes a, a debt to a person of money or something. But in the Jewish context, in which Jesus was speaking here, of course, this idea of paying back a debt and paying for sin was one and the same. So these words transgression, debt, sin, are pretty much all the same meaning. It's an acknowledgement that something has been done to break a proper relationship. Does that help? Thank you for your question. Yes, sir. If you approach someone and ask for forgiveness for something you've done, and the response is, oh, it doesn't matter, or you maybe feel really that the forgiveness is not being granted, what do you do? <coughs> That's a really important question. It's something I think probably we've all experienced, and, and maybe we've been on the other side of that, too. So, and Father Vasilos is really good on this. He says, um, he says it's important to keep in mind that, that forgiveness happens in the person who exercises their freedom. So when we go to someone and we genuinely seek forgiveness, seek reconciliation, seek to apologize, we have done our part. We have exercised our freedom. We have made our offer. And our forgiveness from God really does not depend on whether or not the other person accepts our forgiveness or not. We cannot force it in the same way we can't force love, right? So our responsibility is to genuinely seek forgiveness. Uh, and even when someone maybe asks us for forgiveness and we're not sure that they're sincere, right? Our job is to offer forgiveness with sincerity and leave the rest to God. You don't have to be like, we don't have to be like, well, I'm not sure that was a genuine forgiving act. Are you, are you sure you forgive me? You know, I mean, things, right, we can, we can kind of spoil it. So much of this depends on our, our attitude, our manner. And if we, are, if we are genuine and the other sees that we're genuine, then I think the miracle happens even if the other person doesn't give you the perfect kind of response. And if, so, and if you ask for forgiveness and the other person says, it's okay, it doesn't matter, um, you know, we can, we can follow up and say, well, it matters, it matters to me and, it, and I know that what I did was wrong and so I'm, I'm grateful for your, for your forgiveness, right? I mean, you can kind of say it that way um, to make it a little bit more serious and maybe that helps both of you in your relationship, right? Does that help a little bit? Oh, thank you. Anything else? Okay, time for one more question, if anybody has one. Sure. <coughs> yes, please. What if you can't forgive the other person? 
What if you can't forgive the other person? You can't forgive the other person. Yeah, you try, but you just can't. Yes. So there are a few things we can do. Uh, the first thing is that we need to absolutely keep trying. The second thing is we need to pray, both for God to give us the strength to forgive and to pray for the other person. Uh, one thing that Father Sophroni says in his writings is that we can say the Jesus prayer for ourselves, of course, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. We don't say the Jesus prayer for another person in the same way, but we can say it for another person. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on your servant, Paraskevas, or Michael, or Yoria, or whatever it may be. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on Vasiliki. Right? Don't say a sinner, in other words. We take that part out. We don't judge the other person as a sinner. But we can say the Jesus prayer for the other person. And it's like any relationship, right? Uh, with a good friend, if I do something to my close friend and we have an argument, right, because of what I did, I may be ready to reconcile right away. I call my friend up. I'm like, you know, listen, man, you really got, you know, you got to forgive me. I'm, I'm so sorry. You know what? They may need time. Right? They may need time. So time is a natural part of, of the dynamics of, of forgiveness. But we have to be careful. This is something actually Bishop Kalistos really emphasizes in some of his writings about forgiveness. He says, don't let too much time pass because it's very, it's dangerous. We can lose our opportunity to forgive. And I don't want to sound harsh, but the reality is our Lord's words are pretty clear. If you do not forgive, God will not forgive. Is what this person did to you so awful that it's more significant than all you have done in your life to offend God. And it's more awful to the point that I would trade my entire eternal salvation just so that I can hold on to that sense of being wronged. Most of us, it's easy for me to say that, I understand, from where I, from where I am, but we need to use these teachings of the church to help us to repair those relationships. And the beautiful thing is when we do, especially when it's something very serious like that, we experience Pascha. To forgive is to be resurrected. I think I speak on all of our behalf uh, to say a, a very heartfelt thank you to Deacon Perry for coming and speaking to us tonight. <clears throat> I, on Sunday after church, I mentioned in my remarks uh, to the families down here, uh, we have very few opportunities in our modern day lives to have our souls be fed by the wisdom of the church. And I feel like tonight we had, all of us who are here were able to take advantage and, and take that opportunity to have our souls fed. Um, by the wisdom of the church through his servant, uh, Deacon Perry. So we thank you again, and we wish you Kali Anastasi for you and your family. Uh, at this time, uh, we have some refreshments in Plato Hall, so we'd like to invite all of you to come join us in Plato Hall for some refreshments. We know it's getting late, but uh, take some strength before you make your journey home. Uh, we'd love to see you in Plato Hall, so thank you. Thank you in presbyes aki mi ton feo to con che prostasies sa metanze ton el pitan ta fos che ne crosis fui che cratisen os garzo ismiteran 
prost in joi in me tes lisen, o mitranikisan.